the Subaru Outback range for three weeks now and I've got to tell you it's one of the most car-like SUVs you're ever likely to drive. That's kind of surprising because it's essentially the same size as a Hyundai Santa Fe. The symmetrical all-wheel drive system, well, that's excellent, but I really think Subaru's got to spend a few more dollars on aesthetics. And the service interval, well, at six months, that means the new Outback is unlikely to be the most cost-effective SUV in terms of its overall operating cost. Let's go back to the studio and we'll find out if the new Outback is the right next SUV for you. I've driven all three available powertrains for the Subaru Outback, the 2.0-litre diesel, the 2.5-litre petrol 4, and the 3.6-litre petrol 6. I spent a week in each one, and the vehicles were supplied by Subaru Australia from the company's regular media evaluation fleet. That's the full extent of Subaru's involvement in this review. Like all my reviews, Subaru has no say whatsoever in the comment, which is my honest personal assessment. If Subaru happens not to like some of my comments, I'll add them to the long and distinguished list of car makers in that impotently disgruntled category. They can go keep Mercedes-Benz and their gay 180 company. It probably won't come to that though because I'm pretty impressed by the Outback. Starting with the core strengths, this SUV is just so car-like to drive. That's super impressive. Despite its overall size varying just a few inches one way or the other against key competitors like the Toyota Kluger, Hyundai Santa Fe and even the Ford Territory, Outback simply never feels big and ponderous. It's good around town and on the freeway where it just feels stable and secure. If you believe what those doofuses, hey, I'm pretty sure it's doofi, you know, from the Latin meaning more than one doofus, look it up. Anyway, those doofi at Mazda call Jinba Itai, what? No, they do. It's in every brochure. It means when the horse and the rider become as one, I think metaphorically. Don't start. Anyway, for the record, I have never wanted to be as one, at least not with a horse, but if that changes, I certainly want to pitch and not catch. Make a note. What I'm trying to say is if you want to jinba itai the crap out of driving, then Subaru's pretty good at that with the Outback. You just tell the Outback what to do. It does that, and it does it with reasonable precision. Big jinba itai tick. Thanks a lot for the concept, Mazda. Outback's pretty chuckable too. If you like a conservatively spirited Jinba Itai, pitching but not catching with Mr. Ed on some, you know, bestiality back road. Outback has generally excellent driving dynamics is what I'm trying to say, perhaps with my hoof in my mouth. Another big tick is Subaru's symmetrical all-wheel drive system. People think this gives you more grip, which is actually bullshit. What it actually gives you is greater predictability when the road is slippery. So you in fact get a more progressive transition from grip to slip, in particular when you're applying power. Essentially, all four wheels are driving all the time, and that means for any given level of overall tractive effort, each wheel delivers half the drive torque compared with the job they do on some of those front drive only SUV competitors. Symmetrical all wheel drive is also better than many on demand all wheel drive systems of competitors. On demand systems often take a little bit too long to react and catch up with changes in either the traction underfoot or the driver's acceleration demands. Symmetrical all-wheel drive is incidentally the fundamental reason why Subaru is a popular mainstream car maker today. They used symmetrical all-wheel drive to differentiate themselves from other Japanese car makers. It's great engineering and they used that to clamber out of the pool of obscurity and into the motoring mainstream. People in regional Australia who often drive on, let's face it, fairly shit dirt roads that haven't been maintained all that often since the Big Bang, 
those people understand intimately the advantages offered by symmetrical all-wheel drive. And that's why you see so many Subarus in the bush. The other huge advantage with Outback is EyeSight, Subaru's proprietary autonomous safety system based on two range-finding stereoscopic cameras mounted high up in the windscreen. Here's Subaru Australia's managing director, Nick Senior. The key thing about EyeSight is to try and prevent crashes. It has not just come onto uh, the radar, excuse the pun, over the last three or four years. EyeSight has been 20 years in the making and in the testing, but the big advances have happened in the last five years. It incorporates, uh, in Subaru's case, digital uh, stereo cameras to sense a range of activities, how close you are to the car in front of you, whether you are swerving, whether there is a tendency that you're getting um, a, a bit drowsy. And I think probably in Australia, that's a fairly important one, given the long distances and the uh, high incidence of driver fatigue. And the most common one uh, that we have is nose to tail crashes. So with eyesight, it senses and then it can uh, preempt braking and also brake a lot harder to try and at least minimise or if not completely stop accidents. So it's a range of six or seven key activities designed to prevent or help prevent crashes. So basically, EyeSight's big tricks are that safe distance maintaining adaptive cruise control and autonomous emergency braking. Adaptive cruise and I know you 100 octane in your veins petrol heads already know this, but let's assume momentarily some people are less obsessed with cars than you and they just want to buy one every few years. If that's you, the distinction between adaptive cruise control and old and busted standard cruise control is that adaptive cruise can sense traffic and slow down for congestion automatically and maintain a safe following distance all the while with the cruise control still engaged, which is a pretty cool upgrade if you've never actually tried it. Like going from Rosie O'Donnell to Victoria Beckham kind of thing. You also get some other pretty effective safety subsystems. And at times, you know, driving along randomly bored, thinking about, I don't know, posh spice, a boa constrictor and baby oil, perhaps, there can be a bit of eyesight false alarming going on if false alarming is a verb. Some drivers get a little bit distracted by that intrusion on their posh reptile lubricating flights of fancy. Eyesight is annoyingly detaining you with advice about something you've perhaps already seen. Just bear in mind, however, that eyesight's system has a proclivity to annoy, but also importantly, to save you from that one time when you have failed to identify a serious problem. Posh is perhaps saying, use more oil. Just when a kid inconveniently steps out onto the road between two parked cars. And frankly, if a handful of false positive reptile posh pleasurous interruptus events are the price for preventing one day the worst day of either your life or some other poor bastard's life, then that's probably a decent ethical exchange, don't you think? Because imaginary posh and her... Slippery Snake will wait patiently. Trust me on this, she will. She won't even be mildly annoyed. It's one of life's most enduring maxims. And realistically, if you're on a long drive and you've had six or seven lane departure eyesight warning events in the space of the past 15 minutes, that might be literally a wake-up call that you are too fatigued to be driving a car safely. EyeSight is a brilliant but somewhat redundantly annoying system. It's like, I don't know, wearing a seatbelt. Usually pointless, but when you need it, you so profoundly need it. Just to make sure, if you buy a Subaru with EyeSight, get that insurance that includes windscreen replacement coverage because reinstalling and recalibrating that EyeSight camera hardware is not an especially cheap exercise following a broken windscreen. The final big plus in Outback's arsenal is the price. The range in price is from just under 40 grand to just over $53,000 on the road. And that's a lot less than a Kluger, a Santa Fe, a Sorento, a Territory. 
And okay, in Outback, there are only five seats on offer, but the overall size is brilliant. There's a huge cargo space and the features list is very, very impressive. On the less brilliant side, and there certainly is one of those, first and foremost for me is the transmission. It's a CVT, of which my default setting is, I'm not such a fan. To be fair, Subaru's invested a lot of effort making the CVT in the Outback more responsive and engaging than the first generation CVTs from many manufacturers. But it's still absolutely not as good, meaning not as good nor as progressive and maybe not even as robust as a well-sorted conventional automatic transmission. And some of that comment is an educated guess. In particular, the reservation I have about the CVT in Outback is for heavy towing, heavy-ish towing anyway. When you look at the gross fundamentals of this vehicle, it's the same size broadly as a Santa Fe or Sorento, and yet it tows only 1,500 kilograms against the competitors on 2,000. It doesn't even match SUVs the next size down, like the Mazda CX-5, on 1700 kilograms. So it's not the size nor the weight nor the performance of the available engines imposing this lower maximum towing limit on the Outback. It's the transmission, guaranteed. So I live on the side of this mountain and my driveway approximates, you know, the north face of the Eiger. People die getting to the summit routinely. Though sadly never ex-wives. They live forever. Anyway, the K2 driveway is a great place to investigate the low speed loaded up performance of any transmission. So I'm backing the Outback up the Matterhorn driveway and it's kind of definitely not happy. I've seen happy and not just with a horse or musing posh and the slippery snake, any of that stuff. And this driveway reversing experience is definitely not that. Okay, it's not doing it as well as a conventional automatic transmission, and I definitely wouldn't want to be backing a trailer, boat, caravan loaded with dead bodies, whatever, up a very steep hill in that kind of situation. So if you plan on towing something heavy, meaning close to the limit, meaning if your towed implement weighs 1,200 kilograms or more, and you plan on doing that regularly, I'd be barking up a different SUV towing tree. I'm not so convinced the Outback is the definitive best moderately heavy towing choice available. It also depends how often you intend to do this, obviously. If it's hundreds or even thousands of kilometres every year, I am simply not sold on Outback as a robust moderate to heavy tow platform. But what I'm not saying, absolutely not saying, is to avoid Outback for occasional light towing. Taking the box trailer to, I don't know, bomb makers are us, and coming home with a few hundred litres of kerosene and some hydrogen peroxide, it's all good. Light, infrequent towing, blow yourself up. Heavy towing, not so sure. What? No, I don't think so. Everyone who's studied absolutely already knows that. The other two areas that Subaru really needs to focus on are aesthetics and running costs. I usually don't comment on styling because A, beauty is absolutely in the eye of the beholder. I mean, look at Amber Heard and Johnny Depp. And B, because people have eyes and they don't need to be routinely told how a car actually looks. However, it's pretty clear that companies like Hyundai and Kia, thanks to poaching the former Audi style king Peter Schreyer, have stolen some real aesthetic ground from the likes of Toyota and Subaru. Like, did the roof rails on Outback really have to be that awful and chunky? Really? Would it have been that hard to make the interior at least as well integrated as a Santa Fe or Sorento? And on the oral front, do you think we really need that awful synthesised faux orchestral glissade every time you get inside? Kia does that too, and it is a mistake of letting Donald Trump speak proportions. But at least there's no fake wood in the Outback. And there's only one thing I hate more than fake wood. Hmm? No, Kim Jong-un with an accurate long-range nuke. To be fair, the latest Outback looks a lot better than its predecessor, which I guess is a bit like saying Kim Jong is somewhat more benevolent than his father. The other big criticism here is the service interval and its cost. 
six months and 12,500 kilometres. Many other manufacturers have moved to 12 months and 15,000 k's. Forgive me for being an engineer here, but metallurgy is just metallurgy. Conditions inside engines, well, they're all about the same. They don't vary that much. And oil technology is constant across the entire automotive industry. The reason some companies, of which Subaru is one, are resistant to adopting a 12-month service interval is purely commercial. It's tied to dealer profitability. Double the service interval and you halve the servicing cash flow in dealerships. It's that simple. Dealers would hate that. But then car dealers are between pimps and journalists on the vocational respect hierarchy. So who among us really cares about that? There's no good reason for six monthly services in terms of available metallurgy or oil technology, so it's either just a rip-off or inferior engineering. Subaru needs to try harder in this respect because although the price of the Outback at all grades is extremely sharp, the service cost is comparatively high, and certainly that is something for you to consider before taking the decision to buy one. There are three engines and they all do a pretty good job. The 2.5i four-cylinder petrol is the sweet spot for me in this car. In a straight line, the 3.6-litre six-cylinder goes a lot better, but I'm not so sure it goes six and a half thousand dollars better. So there's a value proposition in play here. And on the diesel front, I'm a little bit underwhelmed by the Subaru diesel. It's basically outgunned by competitors' two-litre diesels. The Hyundai Kia 2.0-litre diesel makes 24% more power and 14% more torque. So you can't be totally sold on the Subaru diesel in terms of being up there with the best on a comparative basis. The other burning question is base spec versus premium spec. It's a $6,000 question for the diesel and the 2.5, and of course the 3.6 is available in premium spec only. There's no poverty 3.6 option. The base car comes with a great deal of standard equipment, so it's definitely not a poverty pack either. It's got a lot of safety equipment in particular, including eyesight. If you jump into premium, you add things like blind spot monitoring, lane change assist, and rear cross traffic alert. You also get a sunroof, a bit of extra garnish, upgraded lighting, an auto dimmer on the mirror, power tailgate, proximity key with push button start, leather eight-way electrically adjustable front seats, the bigger touchscreen and GPS. Premium's nicer of course, but it's not as if the base spec is all that third world to begin with. I didn't jump in the 2.5i and think, ah yeah, Mogadishu. Smells like Black Hawk Down all over again. As a one-size-fits-all family five-seat SUV with solidly practical breadth of capability and a massive cargo volume, it's pretty hard to fault the Outback. Get the windscreen cover on your insurance and expect to pay a little bit more for a service than your neighbours with Mazdas, Hyundais and Kias. But it's going to be great to drive, you know that, right? If you don't need heavy towing or seven seats, an Outback 2.5i Premium is the pick of the litter for me at about 46 grand drive away. And if that seems a little bit rich, it's not really that much of a compromise to step back to the base 2.5i for about 40 grand. And that's certainly an affordable full-sized five-seat SUV. If you want to get the lowest possible price, at least here in Australia, contact me via the website. We get great deals across the Subaru range and every other brand too. And it's completely obligation free and importantly, not a scam. Don't forget to subscribe for regular updates and leave a comment below to let me know what you think. I haven't been getting anything like enough hate mail recently either. So trolls, where are you? Have I lost my troll abuse sex appeal? I certainly hope not. I love it when imbecility and vitriol collide. I miss that. I'm John Cadogan. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.